So yesterday I did a video specifically talking about Genesis 6, 1 and 2, uh, the cohabitation of angels and humans. I noted during those videos specifically that obviously angels don't have a body like men do. And, and if, you, if you see my videos on uh, angels, their nature and their hierarchy ranks and so on, um, I made quite clear that although they, you know, they, they have a certain spiritual, like corporal reality, it's not that they actually have a body with sensations and wants and needs like us. And if you see my video on Satan's uh, sales pitch, essentially, that I released yesterday, also, uh, it, it, it describes very much the fact that because they didn't have a body, that was basically something to exploit. And if we look all throughout the New Testament, we see a facet, uh, I'm sorry, a, a, a fascination rather with, with essentially having sensation. Uh, essentially, Satan sold them the idea that they were being withheld from having sensation um, because God's a big me. Just the same way he lies to us about not having what it is we think we deserve in this life, even though we're sinners and deserve to be destroyed. Um, but he's, he's ever after our weaknesses to be able to sell his nonsense. And uh, that's one of the ways that I'm, I'm, I'm sure the main way that he was able to take the angels with him. So anyway, we're going to talk about Genesis 6, 3 and 6, 4, the spirit's restraint and the Nephilim that came uh, about as a result of these genetic experiments. Because again, even though the women married these angels, there was no actual human interaction between the angels and the women. The women just wanted to have fancy babies and to look cool. And uh, it had to be a willful interaction on the part of the humans. So let's uh, let's get into 6.3 right quick here. And God said, My spirit will not strive with man forever in their sinful manner of life. For this is the way of flesh. Therefore his days shall be 120 years. The divine displeasure evident in the verse above, very odd if the two preceding verses were only relating to normal human pre procreation, which had been divinely commanded in Genesis 1.28, be fruitful and multiply, follows directly on the heels of the intermarriage described in Genesis 6, 1 through 2. Again, see my videos on that, just brought them out yesterday. Verse 3 suggests a double judgment of the most extreme severity. In a mere 120 years, brief by the extended lifespans at that time, look at Methuselah, God would all but bring the human race to an end. And for the progeny of those who would survive in the post-Diluvian or the, the post-flood world to come, the longevity man had previously experienced, nearly a millennium in some cases, again Methuselah, would be reduced to a scant 120 years. And this would be a maximum norm, scarcely ever approached and only rarely exceeded. I think there was only two examples of it um, after the flood. Even in such dire judgment, however, God's gracious nature is clearly perceptible because for the one family of believers left on earth, in other words, that of Noah, the 120 years were an important grace period that gave the necessary time for the ark, God's chosen means of deliverance, to be completed. It is ever thus that by the patience of God we are delivered. And that's a reference to 1 Peter 3.20, specifically talking about how God is not slow in keeping his promises, but making sure everybody that is to make the proper choice will. So let's talk about Genesis 6, 4, the, the Nephilim, or Nephilim, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Uh, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and afterward as well. In other words, before the flood and after the start of the 120 year grace period before the flood. Both before the flood and after the start. Yeah, so not after the flood. They were all wiped out. For when the sons of God went into the daughters of men, they bore to them those mighty ones. In other words, the Nephilim, whose names are famous from ancient times. Which, by the way, side note, may very well explain the names of, like, say, the Greek pantheon or, or the Roman gods. These might be handed down. I mean, even, even uh, who, who was it that wrote the story about the Great Flood? Gargamesh or whatever it is? Yeah, there were other stories of the Flood. It was well known. Um, there's a very good chance that many of these god titles, families, and whatnot were handed down from before the Flood. And of course, as we see from Ham and, and, and Cain and his son, they probably were the ones that believed in it because they were also the ones that exposed their grandfather. But anyway, the transliteration of the Hebrew word Nephilim, Nephilim, is standard practice now because of the NASB and the NIV. They were the ones that started it. On account of the clear unacceptability of the Septuagint's giants. The Septuagint, by the way, is the major Greek translation of the original what's called Masoretic text or the Hebrew text of the Old Testament. They used the word giants because they couldn't really figure out what to put in place, but it is uh, a clearly incorrect translation. 
The Septuagint's interpretation, however ineffective the parallel drawn by Greek, from Greek mythology, is clear to see that these creatures as not entirely human, as Greek giants of myth were not, and that much, at least, is true. By the time we reach Genesis 6-4, interpretations which try and make these Nephilim entirely human have run into a host of difficulties. In the verse above, the extraordinary nature of these creatures is directly related to the fact that they are the progeny of the sons of God. Genetic experiment. And, and, and by the way, the reason why that's not alluded to directly is because how are you going to describe to a bunch of people who have no idea even what genetics are? Anything other than seed and you know, the, the male portion and the female portion. That's just all it is. So uh, it cl it's clear that the angels have control or at least knowledge over a certain amount of genetics. They're not allowed to just go in and mess with things. Clearly, in this case, they broke the rules. And if you see my video yesterday, I explained very clearly how the New Testament goes over the fact that the ones that actually did this are in jail for it to this day. I mentioned that it makes little sense if these sons of God were normal human beings. Sons of God were, were normal human beings. The etymology of the word nephil, and I'm going to try and go over some of this reasonably. Uh, nephilim is actually the plural of the, the nephil, is also enlightening. The root nephal, the, the basis of this nephilim, means to fall. And it's a, it's a passive formation in nature here. Um, so it's, it means that it happened to them and they didn't have any control over it other than their choices and free will thereafter. In other words, they were born fallen this way. The meaning fallen ones is directly in line with our understanding of this passage so far. For the Nephilim were A, fallen from the ranks of pure humanity, B, the offspring of, offspring of fallen angels, and C, fallen in a spiritual sense as well, giving no indication of desiring a relationship with God, a conclusion to which we are forced by their nature I'm sorry, by their failure to respond to his gracious 120-year delay of judgment. For only Noah and his family entered the ark. And we know this from history. So, again, no direct indication of a genetic experiment, but no real explanation otherwise, because the sons of God, as angels, do not have a body, right? But they clearly have some measure of manipulating the creation enough within their own power and their own perceptive capability to be able to create a male seed, knowing full well that the woman is the one who carries the egg. So uh, I'm going to leave this here just so it doesn't end up being too long. Next video is going to be about the divine assessment from Genesis 6, 5 through 7. Hope you guys are finding these useful and enlightening and informative. To me, this totally explains, by the way, the, uh, the entire ancient nature of the world, the strange hominids that existed beforehand, all the different variations of cavemen, as we're, we're told, and likely, not a guarantee, but likely explains the strange fossil record regarding like tree tall, you know, giant lizard like creatures. And again, I'll go back to the fact that Satan went out of his way to choose a snake instead of any other creature, perhaps likely because of a fascination with reptilian type uh, creatures of God's original design. So anyhow, like, share, comment, subscribe. Let me know what you think. Uh, I'll be right back with the Divine Assessment, Genesis 6, 5 through 7. Talk to you guys soon.